other ends. Oh, no matter. I shan't meet anyone necessarily to care about. Goodness gracious, they did walk. I haven't a moment to lose. Fate has slaved me with the most punctual, particular, and peremptory of passes, and I must fulfill my destiny. Open locks, whoever knocks. Good morning, Mr. Cox. I trust you have stepped out to Mr. Cox. I can't stand in, Mrs. B. And I will be quite sure the woman who provided with a marble children's pillow. The one I got now seems to have a handful and a half of feathers at either end, and nothing whatever in the middle. Anything to accommodate you, Mr. Cox. Yeah. And you'll be good enough to hold my glass while I fix my toilet. Certainly, sir. Oh, yes, sir. I believe you've had your hair cut. Cut? Strike me a head and moan. It's very nice of you to mention it, Mrs. B, but I'm sufficiently conscious of the absurdity of my appearance already. Now for my life. <laughs> the effect of having one's hair cut. That has to be quite tidy before. I've got two or three more. Now, far be it from me to hurry your movements 
answer, but I think it only proper to advise you of my immediate intention of divesting myself of my clothing and going to bed. Oh, Mr. Fox! Stop it! Can you inform me as to who the individual is that I invariably meet coming up the stairs when I'm going down and going down the stairs when I'm coming up? Ah, oh, yes, sir, young gentleman, Patsy Antics. Oh, uh, well, there is nothing particularly remarkable about him, except his hats. I meet him in all sorts of hats. Black hats, white hats, hats with broad brims, hats with narrow brims, hats with naps, hats without naps. But in short, I have come to the conclusion that he must invariably be individually and professionally associated with the hatting interest. Yes, sir. Oh, and sir, he begged me to ask you as a particular favor if you would not smoke quite so much. Oh, did he? Yes, sir. Well, then, you may inform the gentle hatter with my compliments that if he objects to the effluvia of tobacco, that he best domesticate himself in some adjoining parish. Oh, Mr. Fox, you wouldn't do me out of a lodger, would you, sir? It would come to exactly that. And if I take the slightest effort to put my pipe out, I at once give you warning that I shall give you warning at once. Yes, Mr. Fox, will there be anything else today? On the contrary, madam, I have had quite enough of you. Well, if ever, what next? It is extraordinary trouble that I always have getting rid of that venerable female. She knows that I am up all night and seems to set her face against my indulging in the horizontal position by day. Oh, now let me see. Shall I take my breakfast before I take my nap, or shall I take my nap before I take my... Or do I really want to take my nap? Now let me see. I purchased a rash of bacon this morning, and... That's funny. Or I purchased a rational beach. Yes, now, and a sea. A penny roll. First, to light the fire. Where are my lucifers? Oh dear. Oh, this is too bad, Bouncer. This is by several degrees too bad. This box of lucifers was full three days ago, and now there's only one. Now, one would think, I happen to know that she purloins my coals and my candles and my sugar, but I would think that my lucifers would be sacred. Now, I wish to ask any unprejudiced person or persons their opinion regarding this candle. Now, first of all, a candle is an article that I do not require as I own during the day. Now, I purchased this candle on the 1st of May, Chimney Speaker's Day, judging that it would last me, oh, three months. Now here, the week is not one half over, and this candle is three parts gone. <clears throat> uh, Mrs. Bouncer is using my gridiron. The last article of food that I cooked upon this was a pork chop, and now it is powerfully impregnated with the odor of red herring. I am awfully tired. I venture to take my nap if there was someone here to supervise the turning of my bacon. Oh, well, perhaps it will turn itself. I really must lie down. Oh, here goes. Thank you, thank you, it is. Oh, my God. 
my vision. Well, shall I curb my indignation? Shall I falter in my vengeance? Ah, I think not.
being blessed with the sight of my beloved. <laughs> Are you married? Uh, me? Well, no, not exactly. A happy bachelor? Uh, no, not precisely. No widower? No, not absolutely. Uh, pardon me, sir, but I can't see how you can help being one of the three. Not help it. I... Yes, not you nor any other man alive. Oh, well, that may very well be, sir, but I am not alive. I don't like joking. I'm, I'm serious, so... sir. I've been defunct for three years. Will you be quiet, sir? If you, uh, if you don't believe me, I shall refer you to a very large, numerous, and respectable circle of disconsolate friends. Dear sir, my very dear sir, if there does exist any ingenious contrivance whereby a man on the eve of committing matrimony might leave this world and yet stop in it. Well, I should not be sorry to know it. <laughs> well, then I tell you that I am not set down as being frantically attached to your intended. No, not exactly. Yet at present I'm only aware of one obstacle to marrying her, and that is that I can't stand her. <laughs> well, then there's nothing more simple to do as I did. I will. What is it? Drown yourself. Will you be quiet? Sir? Uh, listen to me. <clears throat> Three years ago, I had the misfortunes of captivating the affections of a still blooming, yet somewhat middle-aged widow at Ramsgate. Singular enough, just my case. Three months ago at Margate. Well, sir, to escape the lady's importunities, I enlisted in the blues for the lifeguards. So did I. Well, sir, they wouldn't have me. They actually had the effrontery to tell me that I was too tall. And I wasn't tall enough. So I had to content myself with the marching regiment I enlisted. So did I. Well, sir, no sooner had I done so than I was sorry for it. So was I. Well, my infatuated widow offered to her as my discharge on the condition that I would leave her in the autumn. Just my case. Well, sir, I hesitated. At last, I consented. I consented at once. Well, sir. The day set for the happy ceremony drew near. In fact, too near to be pleasant. Well, I suddenly discovered that I was not worthy to possess her. Well, so when I told her this, instead of taking the compliment like a lady, she blew at me like a tiger of the female gender. Well, I rejoined, and suddenly something whizzed past my ear, shivered into a thousand fragments against the mantelpiece. It was the slop face. Mm, I retaliated with a teacup and the department. Uh, the next morning I was served with a notice of action for breach of promise. Well, sir, well, sir, ruin stared me in the face. The action proceeded against me with gigantic strides. I took a desperate revolution. One morning I left my house with a suit of clothes on my back and another in a bundle under my arm. I walked out onto the cliffs. I deposited the contents of the bundle on the very verge of the precipice. I looked down to the yawning gulf beneath me and walked off in the opposite direction. I understand what you mean. Ingenious creature. You disappeared. Your clothes were found. Exactly. <coughs> and in the pocket of the coat, or the waistcoat, or the pantaloons, don't remember which, was found a piece of paper with these effective words written on it. This is thy work, O Penelope Ann. Penelope Ann? Penelope Ann? Penelope Ann. Originally widow of William Wiggins. Originally widow of William Wiggins. Proprietor of bathing machines. Proprietor of bathing machines. And Margate. And Ramsay. It must be she. And you, sir, you are a long lost lamented box. I am. And I was about to marry the poor creature you so cruelly deceived. But ah, then you are caught. I am. Well, Cox, I know you, and I congratulate you. I give you joy. Now I must take a stroke. Oh, you don't, sir. I shall not lose that you, sir. I restore to you the arms of your own head. I am your intent. No, yours. But well, how could she be my intended now that I'm proud? There's no such thing as I'm representing you to Penelope yet. I have no desire to be introduced to your intended. How can that be? You propose to her first. That may never be, but you pop the question afterwards. Very well. Very well. You are much more worthy of her than I. I <laughs> <laughs> believe it, and you follow the generous impulse of my nature. I give her up to you. <laughs> Thank you. 
take two thirds. No, take three fourths. No nonsense. Half and half.
another part of London to a charity where my baby sister, Buffalo, she's Mrs. Buffalo Lamb now, has decided to follow my standing example and to take in borders herself. I hope that she'll be as lucky with hers as I have been with mine, as we proudly present lodgings to let. Oh, 
time towards that moment happened. Talk of the town being an unruly member, it was an unruly Irish member. Thought you'd never escape it. Not even on the happy family. Telling her I had a rash coming out of the doctor and up the smallpox. She let me go quickly down there. Well, I think it would have a different plan for the future. And too easy, that's what they say. Take advantage of me. Yes, well, I'm going to be more firm and resolute now. Pluck up a spirit. Show them I'm not a man to be trifled with. They can't have their own way with me. Oh, no. I'll show them. Oh, dear, here she comes. Oh, oh what's lucky. Jemima was out. Oh, he was here. A burglar. No, he doesn't look as though he meant a burglar. I'm awful sorry, but if he were, I could call the police. And if he's a larger, I can't. However, I must be determined. Well, sir, what do you want? Beholding me a poor, unfortunate widower who's been badgered and 
He's beaten to death by him. He paid his landlady and so almost frightened to death. But I assure you, sir, the very thought of a lodge of it is more than I can bear. I'm that nervous. <laughs>
it's, it's microphones around the room. So on the count of three, what you do is you shout out the name of the place you're from. There will be an electric tally, and you can look for it in tomorrow morning, California. So, one, two, three, four!
was happy, but now I'm forlorn, just like an old coat that is tattered and torn. Left in this wide world to fret and to mourn, betrayed by a maid in her teens. Oh, the girl that I loved, she was handsome, and twas her that I so tried to please. But I never could please her one daughter so well as the man on the flying trapeze. <laughs>
number. No, 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 not quite. Never mind, I'll do it myself. Ladies and gentlemen, for your listening pleasure, here is our next number. No, you're right, Ollie, that is much better. Thank you, sir. Let's go eat. <laughs>
The umpire yelled, Strike two! Fraud, cried the maddened thousands, and echo answered fraud. But one scornful look from Casey as the audience was awed. <clears throat> they saw his face grow stern and cold. They saw his mind afraid. They knew that Casey wouldn't let that ball go by again. The sneer is gone from Casey's lips. His teeth are clenched in hate. He pounds with cruel violence his back upon the plate. And now the pitcher holds the ball, and now he lets it go. And now the air is shattered by the force of Casey's blow. Somewhere in this favorite lamp, the sun is shining bright. The band is playing somewhere. Somewhere hearts are light. Somewhere men are laughing. Somewhere children shout. But there's no joy in mud. Mikey Casey has struck out.
I'm so broke, I couldn't buy a girl a nickel coat. Still a little like a millionaire when I take me down to Main Street and I review the hair on parade before me there. I ain't cutie.
And then, on February 22nd, our next show opens. The name of it is Rags and Riches, and it is a full bore, boo hiss, streets of old New York Philadelphia. We have not one, not two, but three evil henchmen. Yes. Yeah. And we have a hero and a heroine that you will not soon forget that will all be followed by a fabulous Irish vaudeville. And so that starts on the 22nd of February. Don't miss it. And I have a personal request for all of you. If any of you have had that extra glass of wine, that extra mug of beer tonight, let somebody else drive it home, okay? Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. You have been wonderful. Good night. Oh, 
buds like this don't blossom in the hands of he is like my dear. They wither and decay, killed by the frost of infidelity. Oh, sir, you have crushed my rose. Oh, pardon me. I was thinking of you, wife. You'll forgive me, won't you? Yes, I forgive you. Because there are tears in your eyes. I know a big man like you don't cry unless he's seen a lot of trouble. See? I'm going to give you this rose. I'm going to pick it right here for you. Then when you look at it, you'll remember someone cares for you. And you won't drink anymore, will you? Then, when you meet your own little girl, you can give her the rose. Thank you, girl. You put new life in me. <laughs> and one day, one day I'll come back here and I'll hunt you up. And I'll show you what a few kind words and a generous act can do for a fellow who's down on his luck. And I give you my promise that from this day on, I shall steer clear of places like that. Yeah. Just about fit 